So welcome everybody to One World Mathematical Game Theory Seminar. We're proud to have with us today Takua Sugaya from Stanford. He's Associate Editor in Journal of Economic Theory, Economic Theory, Japanese Economic Review. He researches repeated games, uh, some with incomplete information, some with imperfect monitoring, but also dynamics that result from interactions between policy or politics and markets. Uh, today, he's gonna talk to us about uh, repeated games and Sugaya, the, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, I will talk about uh, information requirements for cooperation. This is a, a joint work with Alex Oetsky. I think he's, he's here. Yeah. So, and uh, one uh, announcement is I circulated a paper, and the circulated paper was about the limit where the number of players go to infinity or become very large and then ask like what is the information requirement for cooperation we kind of like reorganize a paper so that we can look at other limit or comparative statics about the parameter of the stage game as well when we talk about the information requirement for cooperation so uh, hopefully we can cover a slightly more general result but it's essentially the same paper, same result, uh, but that's the, that's the change. Okay, so let me start with the introduction. So intuitively speaking, you know, like to support cooperation in repeated games, we think that we need more precise information or precise monitoring of deviation is needed if discount factors are low. And it seems very intuitive, but it's not that easy to employ in the standard analysis to capture this trade-off and then talk about what's the information requirement for cooperation given uh, one particular discount factor, which is not going to one. Uh, because uh, in a standard approach, we often <laughs> like this. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, uh, in a, a standard approach, we often fix all parameters except for the discount factor and taking discount factor going to one. And uh, that's kind of like one very particular comparative statics when one particular parameter is going to some limit, but uh, it doesn't allow us to conduct uh, other comparative statics when discount factor is away from one. So in public monitoring, so supposing that uh, we consider the repeated games where everybody observes the same signal about an actions or signals are perfectly correlated, then Kandori uh, in his uh, 1992 paper shows that the higher discount factor expands perfect public equilibrium fail set. So if we focus on the equilibrium where everybody on the uh, everybody's strategy is only like contingent on the public history, then higher discount factor expand the equilibrium fail set. And the more precise monitoring in Blackwell sense also expands the equilibrium set. But exact trade-off between monitoring and the discount factor is not known. Uh, in uh, private monitoring, uh, where players observe signal about other players' actions, but signals are not necessarily perfectly correlated, or even in public monitoring, if we consider private strategies where players take uh, mixed strategies and players' future strategy depends on the realization of your own action mixture. In that case, how do you pretty much anything is known when this kind of factor is away from one? And uh, Alex and I have a paper uh, which shows actually that uh, for a very low discount factor, it could be the case that uh, having a worse monitoring, in a sense, uh, signal becomes less precise about actions in the Blackwell sense, uh, sometimes helps. And to get that to intuition of that result, imagine that, uh, you know, you as a principal, players are an agent, and, you know, you want to implement some particular action by recommending uh, action to players. And in that case, you know, from mechanism design perspective, 
you can sort of see the intuition of why giving too much information to uh, players slash agent is not a good idea sometimes because agent can sort of have a better sense of what's going on on other players uh, end and can tailor deviation better. And sometimes that effect uh, dominates as a positive effect of monitoring. For example, we can detect the deviation more precisely and stuff. And so if we look at a particular stage game and a very low discount factor, this kind of a, uh, you know, uh, phenomena might happen. So that makes uh, things kind of like complicated. So that's, uh, that's the current uh, stage of our literature. And what we do is to we derive an upper bound. So we, we don't fully exactly characterize the equilibrium payoff set uh, given the stage game and a discount factor and monitoring structure. Rather, we derive an upper bound on the equilibrium payoff set. And that upper bound is a function of a discount factor and the informativeness of monitoring uh, that I'm gonna define later formally and the stage game payoffs. Okay, so if you give me these three, so this is a discount factor. This is a distribution of signals conditional on actions. And here is a stage game payoffs. Then I can calculate this upper bound. And hopefully uh, we can persuade that uh, this upper bound, nonetheless, it's not always tight. It's still useful to conduct some uh, compatible studies. Can I can I ask a question? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, is it uh, is it the lowest upper bound in some cases, or you? That depends. Oh, you mean like uh, whether it's tight or not? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, is the supremum or or not? I think if you uh, so if you take a particular limit where a discount factor is going to one or informativeness of monitoring converge to perfect monitoring and stuff. Uh, it's for, it's it converge to the same folk theorem payoff set, but away from those limit, I think for most of the cases there is some slack. So it's not not exactly tight. I think. Yeah. Uh, and uh, nonetheless, when we take uh, so when we say comparative statics, we often consider. Uh, two parameters of the model move together and take some particular limit. For example, uh, looking ahead a little bit, you know, for example, when we consider frequent action limit where players are taking actions more and more frequently, in that case, we move discount factor and the informativeness of monitoring at the same time. And uh, we use this upper bound to uh, conclude certain uh, uh, properties about the uh, equilibrium payoff in those kind of limits. And for those purposes, this upper bound is still, still useful. And also we, we get the non-trivial uh, upper bound on equilibrium payoff uh, when this kind of factor is, is away from one. So it's probably not tight, but still can exclude a particular outcome of the repeated games. So, okay, good. And then uh, this informativeness of the monitoring is measured by uh, its uh, chi-squared divergence as we're gonna define later. And one particular feature of this uh, information measure is that uh, we uh, invali uh, this measure is invariant to how information is dispersed among players in a sense that I'm gonna explain in a second. So, Okay, so supposing that uh, here's, here's a definition of the informativeness of, of the monitoring. So supposing that uh, there's a mediator or a mechanism designer, if you wish, uh, who sends a recommendation of actions to players, okay? And so there's a media, so they kind of like play correlated equilibrium. So there's a mediator and the mediator sends an individual recommendation of actions to players and you only know your own recommendation. And you take actions. And then that determines action profile A. And once A is realized, that determines the signal profile Y. And, uh, and this signal profile Y is distributed according to some distribution Q of Y given A. 
And we consider private monitoring environment. So this Y is a signal profile. So this is a vector that stack what player one observes, what two play, player two observes, and what two player three observes, etc. So A is also a vector which stack everybody's action. Okay. And the informativeness of the signal uh, for a particular strategy. So you know you get a recommendation from the mediator and you take a particular deviation strategy that given this recommendation, particular recommendation, I'm gonna you know, take some other, another action possibly. So this sigma is a deviation strategy. And the detectability for such deviation is defined as follows. So what is this? So supposing that the mediator after player decides a deviation, can pick the best recommendation action profile uh, to detect such a deviation. So the order is slightly changed now that the supposing that the mediator uh, knows that uh, this is a deviation and that she thinks that uh, what's the best action to detect such a deviation. So th that's why there's a max of A here. So this action is the best action to, uh, to detect such a deviation and uh, how to measure the informativeness of the signal is, well, if everybody follows this recommendation A, QI of A is a probability that A happens on path. And if this person deviates according to this strategy, that person's action is mapped to another action and everybody else follows the uh, recommendation. So this difference, if this difference is bigger, then it's easier to detect the deviation in some sense. So that's why we use this uh, as an information measure. And we normalize uh, this difference by the equilibrium probability and the take squared, and then take an expectation according to the equilibrium distribution of the signal. So this is the detectability of this particular deviation sigma i for this particular player i. Okay, so that's our definition of the informativeness of the signal. And the reason why I said that this uh, measure is uh, invalidant to how uh, information is dispersed among uh, players is supposing that uh, compare two scenarios. One is that the player one observes uh, signal one and the player two observes signal two. That's one scenario. Another scenario is player one observes the signal one and two, and the player two observes no signal. And uh, if we calculate the information measure, uh, as long as the distribution of signal one and the two stays the same, this measure stays the same, right, basically. So, so that's why uh, this uh, information measure is independent of how information is dispersed among uh, among players. So in some sense, we focus on the informativeness of the signal available to the community or society of the players as a whole, rather than how it's distributed among players. And on the one hand, it's a little bit of the limitation of the upper bound because we don't take into account how precisely the signal is distributed among players. But at the same time, uh, since we look at the uh, overall available information for the community of the players, so it still makes sense economically and allows us to derive a useful upper bound. So that's, uh, that's... Um, I got a question if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it, I assume that you maybe rule out somehow the possibility that a deviation of player I is detected only by signals to player I himself, right? Uh, well, so I guess uh, this information measure doesn't uh, doesn't uh, take that into account, right? Uh, as long as player one signal perfectly detected player one's action, that that's kind of fine in terms of this information measure. And the reason is uh, we consider the relax problem that uh, there's a mediator. I'm gonna define the game formally later. And this mediator, we allow this mediator to observe all action profiles directly without relying on the report from the players. So we could also consider the a variant of our model where mediator cannot observe signals directly, but has to rely on a report coming from players. In that case, we can probably take that into account, 
it's an interesting extension exercise that uh, we try a little bit. It causes some problem in the proof, so it's not that straightforward. But but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting question. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, anything else? Okay. So this is a detectability of a particular uh, uh, sorry particular deviation sigma i, and then. Uh, we can consider the detectability of the deviation that is easiest to detect. So that's a deviation that maximizes this difference. So rather than thinking about one particular deviation, I'm gonna, I can think about one particular deviation that is particularly easy to detect. And since we are looking at an upper bound, we can write down the upper bound uh, of our equilibrium pale set as a function of the discount factor and this uh, highest uh, information uh, in format of user monitoring and the stage game. All right. And then this upper bound, it's, uh, it's an upper bound, but still allows us to get uh, certain uh, results or comparative statics. So the circulated paper was about the large uh, population games, and we can also consider uh, largely uh, the limit where the number of players going to infinity. And in that case, uh, what is the requirement for the informative signal? And you know, if you look at the literature, Al Najir and Smradinsky, or uh, Fyodor Babalevin and the Pissendorfer, uh, they looked at this uh, question. And another limit that we can take is a frequent action limit where underlying game and the signal structure is defined in continuous time, players take actions every certain interval of the time, and we take that interval smaller and smaller. In that case, discount factor and the precision of the monitoring change together. And we can take that limit, uh, like uh, Sanikovsky Patch's paper or uh, classical uh, paper by Avril Miron Pierce. Uh, another uh, uh, question is supposing we fix everything but discount factor and I take discount factor going to one and supposing that we know that in that environment folks are imposed, but how quickly is equilibrium pale set converges to the to the feasible and individually rational pale set, right? And uh, given our upper bound, uh, we can uh, calculate that uh, convergence rate of equilibrium payoff. And we sort of get the same rate as Kona and Takahashi. So that's another way to use our upper bound. Okay. And then uh, hopefully these uh, applications uh, are useful uh, to see how our upper bound can be used. Uh, then the last exercise that we do is we sort of argue that this upper bound is, I mean, not exactly tight, but uh, tight uh, in some sense. Uh, by constructing a lower band on the equilibrium pair of set if we assume that the monitoring is public. So if the monitoring is public, we know how to construct the PPE relying on APS. So we know that this is a lower band of the equilibrium pair of set. We have an upper band of the equilibrium pair of set. And we sort of argue that this difference is kind of small. Okay, and what do you exactly mean by small and tight? I'm gonna define it later. Okay. Questions? All right. So let me go to the model. So the model is very standard. So the stage game uh, is defined by the set of players and uh, a finite set of uh, players' actions and the payoff function. And everything is assumed to be finite today. And the monitoring structure uh, Y and Q, Y is a set of signal profile and the Q is a distribution. So given the action profile A, each player I observes a player I's element of signal with probability Q of a vector of Y I's given action profile. So this is a joint conditional distribution of signal profile given action profile, All right? And then in each period, players draw a public randomization device 
And we don't use this for the lower bound, only use this for upper bound. So this is sort of without loss and the players take actions and then private signal profile is drawn according to the distribution. And we just repeat this game infinitely many times. Okay, very standard repeat again. And then we ask what is a necessary condition for the for, for cooperation or cooperation or taking a action distribution that has a non-trivial deviation gain, uh, more precisely speaking. Okay. And to get an upper bound, uh, I already sort of hinted when I answer the question, but we consider the following game with a mediator. And this game uh, admits a larger equilibrium payoff set than the original game. Uh, so this is an upper bar. So what the, media, what the mediator does, what does mediator do in this game? So a mediator draws a recommendation of actions from some distribution and sends the player I's component of action to player I. Okay, and this is player I's private information. And so, and other players do not know, play I takes some action AI that may not be the same as a recommendation. But since we are looking at the Nash equilibrium of this game, the liberation principle readily holds. So we can actually say that in equilibrium, uh, you know, the report from the mediator is the action that you're supposed to take and you take that action in equilibrium, okay? And the signal profile Y is distributed according to the uh, uh, distribution that we just defined. And uh, here was my answer uh, to the previous question, but play I observes her own component of signal, the mediator observes the entire signal profile directly, okay? And we could say that then like player I needs to report that signal to the mediator and consider that as an upper bound. That's an interesting uh, exercise to do, I guess. And uh, we bound the Nash equilibrium or forge called the communication equilibrium of this game. Good. And to define an upper bound, I need to define a few objects. So in uh, following two slides, uh, a little bit notation heavy, especially given the online seminar, so uh, bear with me. So suppose we fix uh, one particular equilibrium distribution of outcomes or histories, okay? Then this particularly determines the marginal distribution of POT action profiles. So, you know, once we uh, fix one equilibrium that determines uh, uh, distribution of histories, so we can ask in POT from the ex -ante perspective, what would be the distribution of action profile in POS T? And that is denoted by alpha T given equilibrium distribution mu. Okay. And then uh, we consider occupation measure over action uh, profile induced by this mu. What is this? So occupation measure for action profile A is just a discounted sum of the probability that action A is taken from the exante perspective in each POT. T. Okay. So this is essentially expected frequency of action A being observed in equilibrium uh, properly discounted over time. All right. And then uh, since this alpha mu is a distribution of actions, uh, we can define the variance of player I's payoff under this action distribution alpha mu and we write uh, VI of alpha mu uh, for the variance of player I pay of uh, distribution and uh, this action distribution alpha mu. And similarly, we can define the deviation gain for player I when mediator recommends actions according to this alpha mu. Okay, so this alpha mu is a distribution of actions. So we can consider sort of one shot game where mediator comes in and recommend actions according to this alpha mu and ask what would be the deviation gain if you deviate from the recommendation according to this uh, schedule sigma i. Well, in that case, the deviation gain from alpha mu according to this schedule sigma i is, so this is uh, probability that one particular action is recommended 
when AI is recommended, you deviate according to sigma i. So this is your deviation payoff. This is your equilibrium payoff. We take a distance and a difference and they take expectation with respect to recommendation. This is a deviation payoff. All right. Uh, I hope this is the last uh, definition that I need to give you. I think that's the case, okay? And this deviation gain is defined over occupation measure. So in some sense, uh, very naively speaking, uh, every period, whenever you are recommended some particular action, you always deviate according to this sigma i, what would be the expected deviation gain that you can accumulate over time, that, that, that's this measure, right? Because alpha mu is the occupation measure, which is a discounted sum of the uh, action distribution over a period. Okay, so in some sense, this player says that I'm gonna deviate in the same way every period, what would be the deviation gain of such a deviation? Yep. All right. All right, then uh, this uh, detectability, I kind of covered in the introduction. So hopefully it looks uh, slightly familiar, but the detectability of deviation uh, is uh, supposing that uh, we can pick a best action to detect that particular deviation sigma i, then the difference between equilibrium probability of signal profile versus what's the probability that, that, that such a signal happens uh, and as a deviation, take a difference, normalize square to get sort of a distance and then take expectation. Okay, so since we are taking a max action to detect a deviation, this is independent of mu. Okay, and uh, I guess there's a, another kind of like extension that we could think about is we consider this max uh, for some particular reason in that uh, it, that is kind of like a hidden in the, in, the, in the proof. But another uh, question, uh, in addition to the scenario where mediator cannot directly observe signals, is that, uh, you know, is there somehow we can sort of incorporate a restriction that, uh, you know, those actions, it's not necessarily always a maximum action to detect the deviation, but equilibrium distribution of action is uh, determined by mu, so can we incorporate that or not? Okay, so that probably, if we can successfully do it, we probably can get a slightly tighter upper bound. So, okay, good. So then here's the theorem. So for any communication equilibrium outcome mu, the time average action distribution, so this is occupation measure, that we defined a few slides ago, satisfies the following in inequality. So for any player and any uh, static, or, no, not static, but you know, this is a deviation, in a sense, it's a, in a static game. Uh, and if we calculate a deviation gain in a static game where mediator recommends actions according to alpha mu, that must be no less than a square root of delta divided by one minus delta, pi squared and the variance of alpha mu. Okay, uh, so this is one version. Another version, depending on which one you like, is for any communication equilibrium outcome mu, this action distribution alpha mu is a epsilon correlated equilibrium in a static game where epsilon for particular player i corresponds to the right-hand side of uh, this inequality. And to make sure that uh, this is independent of sigma i, we take a max and then uh, that's a corollary. Okay, so it's sort of like we take a, uh, occupation measure and then like put that into the stage game, static game context and check whether that is a uh, epsilon correlated equilibrium or not. And if that's yes, then that is an equilibrium that at least doesn't violate our upper bound. If it's not, then it will be outside of an upper bound. Okay. Uh, I was about to say something. Oh, yes. And uh, let me try to interpret this a little bit. <laughs> to at least like, to see whether this makes sense or not, right? So when this kind of factor is going to one, this becomes more slack, which kind of makes sense, right? And when detectability gets better, this gets more slack. That also makes sense. If variance becomes bigger, intuitively speaking, uh, 
you know, we have a more valiance after a history which indicates your cooperation versus computation payoff after a history where the signal indicates your deviation, right? So if these two are far apart, then the variance gets bigger. So if variance gets bigger, it's easy to uh, deter deviation because we can say, if you, if signal says you did a good thing, I will give you a very high computation payoff. If not, I will give you a very low computation payoff that increase the variance that easy to devi uh, deter deviation. So in that sense, it kind of makes sense. Okay. And the disbound holds for general game with uh, private monitoring. Uh, in this context, uh, there are some known bounds uh, in the literature. And uh, let me summarize all of this. So these are mainly uh, derived without putting any constraint on quantization pairs. So they essentially say, consider first period problem, assuming that from second period on, we can implement any feasible payoff and then get an upper bound. So in that case, uh, we have a somewhat similar, but this kind of factor comes outside of the square root. It kind of makes sense because one shot deviation gain is a one minus delta order compared to the condition payoff. And what we need to do at least to get the somewhat a tight bound, uh, which will be useful for our purpose, is to put this one minus delta inside of this square root, mathematically speaking, to get the slightly tighter bound. Uh, and we need to do this by putting some sort of a recursive uh, bound on uh, quantization payoff. But it's well known that in the context of uh, private monitoring or private strategies in public monitoring, exact equilibrium uh, strategy distribution doesn't admit uh, any useful recursive formulation. So that's a challenge. And how we do it, uh, rather than going through the proof, I'm gonna just give you some intuition, okay? So supposing we consider prisoner's lemma and only a perfectly correlated uh, binary signal, a good or bad, okay? And supposing that a good happens more often if more player uh, cooperates, okay? And in period one, let's say like a mediator try to uh, implement cooperation uh, from, from player one, and since uh, there's an instantaneous deviation gain, only way to implement such cooperation in incentive compatible way is that uh, after good signal, uh, player one's condition pair becomes higher. After bad signal, uh, uh, it delivers a lower condition pair, okay? And let's consider the continu continuation payoff distribution period two from the exante perspective. And supposing that from exante perspective, this uh, variance of the condition payoff uh, is uh, within the uh, static correlated equilibrium payoff set, our upper bound say that uh, that's okay, we don't need to worry about this. However, if that is more than the variance of the payoff of a static correlation equilibrium payoff, then again, the mediator needs to implement something that is not myopic capital response. And so in that case, uh, we have a somewhat a similar requirements at the higher condition payoff after good signal and a lower condition payoff after bad signal or postpone the promise. But postponing the promise comes uh, with the cost because future is discounted. So the variance will be increased. So this anyway will increase the variance of the condition payoff for period three. So we can actually write down somewhat a recursive formulation uh, for the lower bound of our at the yeah, lower bound of the variance of the continuation payoff when we try to implement the action sequence alpha mu. And if we sort of recursively apply this variance, we get a lower bound of the variance phi in future. Since everything is bounded in this environment, this variance cannot explode without a bound. And that Okay, that that uh, that requirement, a lower bound of the variance cannot go to infinity. That gives us an upper bound of the equilibrium pair. Right? So that's the intuition. A formal proof, I'm gonna skip it. Right? Question? No. 
if there's a question, I can I can cover the proof, but otherwise, okay. Then, uh, all right. Then let me try to apply this uh, for uh, large population games. So this is a part that was the main forecast of the paper that I circulated uh, last week. So, you know, if you look at the application of repeated games, uh, often, you know, we have a lot of players like uh, public goods provision games, uh, community resource management, uh, risk sharing in rural villages, and even for collusion, I guess, Last year or so, I guess Financial Times had some article about this uh, Maple Soap cartel. This is a government guaranteed cartel of uh, maple syrup producers in, in Quebec, in Canada. And I think this consists of uh, more than like 200 uh, maple soap producers, I think. And so even sometimes collusion involves a lot of participants. And again, you know, if you try to look at the standard uh, repeated game literature, it's kind of hard to uh, see the effect of having a lot of players, but intuitively we kind of believe that as more players are there, at least we need more information to detect their deviations. And uh, in a standard approach, we fix everything except for discount factor and take data go to one. This doesn't capture the situations where players may be patient in absolute sense. So we take a sequence of games where delta and n move together, delta go to one, but not patient compared to the population size n. So one minus delta times n may or may not be close to zero. Uh, another separate question is whether one minus delta times n is a right metric to consider or to capture whether or not players are patient compared to population size. And given our upper bound, it is a right measure to capture that uh, patients compared to the population size n, but that's also what we can use our, our upper bound for. Also for the information requirement, uh, we kind of believe that uh, more information is needed in large, uh, larger population games, but pairwise for rank uh, generically holds if the cardinality of signal is no less than the sum of the action of two players minus one for all players. So that means that, uh, you know, as long as individual players number of action is, is uniformly bounded, uh, we only have uh, this many signals and uh, that requirement doesn't change even if n goes to infinity. So it's kind of hard to talk about the information requirement uh, by just looking at the pairs rule. Okay, so, uh, so we take a sequence of repeated games. Uh, so stage game G that involves number of players discount factor and modern structure. And, and uh, we assume that absolute value of per period payoffs is uniformly bounded from above by U bar. So this guarantees that the variance of the payoff that uh, we derived in an upper bound is, uh, is bounded by U bar squared. That is helpful. And, uh, oh yes, yeah, so, so that's, that's what I just said. Okay, so then like we can use our upper bound to say that for any sequence of uh, repeated games, such that one minus delta divided by average of the detectability of the deviation that is easiest to detect is going to infinity and uh, consider any corresponding sequence of Nash equilibrium payoff uh, profile B, then for any small epsilon, uh, there exists a threshold along the sequence, such that if we look at the far along the sequence, this payoff vector needs to be uh, consistent with uh, epsilon myopic play. I'm gonna define epsilon myopic play in the next slide. 
but this essentially says that average detectability of the deviation needs to be at least uh, non-trivial compared to one minus delta. Otherwise, we get a negative result, uh, like play needs to be uh, Ipsion myopic. What is Ipsion myopic? Well, the, okay. uh, uh, the, what is Ipsion myopic play? V is uh, consistent with Ipsion myopic play if there exists some action distribution that achieves V as a target payoff. And if you look at the population average of the deviation gain from alpha, then that is no more than Ipsion. Okay, so this essentially says that uh, to have a non-trivial equilibrium where average deviation gain is stay away from Ipsilon, then we need to monitor uh, average players uh, with precision at least uh, one minus delta order. So that means that we need to monitor most of players with uh, sufficient uh, precision, which is uh, greater than one minus delta. And we can actually prove by using the, what is called, uh, entropy and the channel capacity and things like that to, to show that uh, the sum of the detectability is bounded by logo of uh, cardinality Y. So this requires that when one minus delta times N is large, which means that the delta is not small compared to the uh, size of the population, then we need a large number of signal profiles because otherwise this guy goes to infinity. Okay. Sorry, I think I missed something. A channel capacity means. Uh... I means that. Uh, uh, You know, like uh, this, like uh, chi square the divergence is informativeness of the signal, which kind of like relates to how much, uh, supposing that the players are taking mixed actions and you observe signal, and then like uh, you try to update what action has been taken by players. And that uh, can be translated into a reduction of the entropy. Because you know al alpha is a exante distribution. You observe a signal, then you update the information. How much uncertainty compared to alpha is uh, reduced by looking at the signal? That is uh, mutual information of the signal. Uh, and uh, chi squared is also like uh, you know how signal differs when players change actions. So these two are kind of like related and uh, for uh, entropy measure uh, bounding something by low of cardinality is relatively easy and so we can use that uh, relationship between chi squared and the mutual information and the bound of mutual information with the respect to log of y we can conclude this and to get this at least like we need to put some uh, restrictions that the players are taking uh, fully mixed actions and, and stuff. So there's some like a uh, details that is kind of missing, but yeah. Okay. Okay. A uh, frequent action limit. This is for just two slides. So supposing that uh, we define the continue uh, underlying game in the continuous time, time froze from a period zero to infinity, players take an action every capital delta time interval, discount factor is a uh, real discount factor R and exponential discounting. And supposing that the players observe signal uh, part and the full distribution, uh, in a time interval n minus one delta n delta when n is a natural number is either some like a Brownian or Poisson distribution determined by the action that is taken at the beginning of the interval, okay? And we take a sequence where capital delta is going to zero. So in that case, this kind of factor is going to one, but since time interval is getting smaller and smaller, the amount of information that we can get 
about a particular action that is taken at a particular time period is getting smaller and smaller. So in, for that sense, uh, we are deteriorating monitoring and uh, making this count factor going to one at the same time. So what's going to happen to our upper bound? Uh, our upper bound deviation gain is less than uh, square root of this formula. Uh, this term, the, the discount factor and uh, precision of, of the monitoring uh, stay constant for each deviation uh, or like limit is well defined and we can show that it's nicely converging to that limit when we take a discount factor uh, going to zero. So which kind of suggests that we are capturing the trade-off between discount factor and uh, monitoring reasonably well, because otherwise, uh, you know, if we sort of take a limit where data going to zero, something uh, funky might happen, but it's not the case. And the limit of this one is kind of well defined. And we can also uh, examine how it is uh, related to the sufficient condition for the Fox CLM in uh, Yuli's econometrica paper where monitoring is parabolic and the distribution is Brownian and things like that. And we can sort of show that at least in terms of the rate of the discount factor and monitoring, our upper bound is kind of tied. Okay. And the last uh, way to use our upper bound, um, last means that the last one that we can think of, if you have any other suggestions, uh, we would be more than happy to hear is a convergence to the Fox theorem fails. Okay, so uh, here was a theorem, a slightly uh, light color. Uh, so supposing that, uh, uh, you know, we want to use this upper bound uh, to consider, well, this kind of factor going to one. We know given the monitoring structure, we fix the monitoring structure and the stage game first, and I take this kind of factor going to one. And we know that in this environment, folks have holds. So the equilibrium payoff set will converge to the feasible payoff set at some point, but how quickly we it to a uh, discount factor, right? That, that's what we want to, uh, to, to see. And, and uh, remember this alpha mu were in the statement of the theorem was the occupation measure. So this is a discounted sum of the uh, probabilities that the action is taken. Okay, so supposing that, so this is a presentation like a uh, feasible payoff set, and we want to approach this extreme point in a feasible payoff set, right? And uh, since this is an extreme point, only way to implement this point is to always take this point, right? So this alpha becomes degenerate when we get closer to this. That's, necessar ne sorry, that's necessarily reduce the variance of the continuation payoff because uh, the distribution becomes degenerate, then the variance converts to zero. So that, that means that, uh, that this our upper bound puts some uh, restriction on how quickly we can approach to this extreme point because if we reach uh, this extreme point, variance gets zero. So this, this kind of factor is, is close to one but fixed then there is a limitation of how close we can be at the, to this extreme point because otherwise variance becomes uh, too small and the deviation gain because would be bigger than the right hand side that's going to violate our upper bound so we need to modify this bound a little bit which is probably beyond the uh, details that we can cover in a one hour seminar but we can conclude that as a distance between the equilibrium payoff and an extreme point with a positive deviation gain is of order one minus delta once we fix uh, everything except for the discount factor. And uh, this order is the same order as what the owner Takahashi got from uh, public monitoring in their jet paper. So, that's another uh, way to use our upper bound and also another indication that our, up, up, oops, our upper bound in terms of the rate uh, to capture the trade off. In terms of the rate, we capture the trade off between monitoring and the discount factor uh, reasonably well.
question. No. All right. Uh, so I have approximately 10 minutes, I guess. Good. So uh, the last part is a sufficiency for cooperation. So uh, we try to construct a lower bound of the equilibrium pair set, and we'd like to argue that uh, this lower bound is sufficiently close to our upper bound. And the one environment where uh, we know how to construct an equilibrium is public model, right? So uh, we use uh, public modeling as a particular uh, example, and we focus on public modeling here, and no mediator, okay? And whenever we use uh, distribution P, that, that means public monitoring. And the Q, remember, was a general uh, uh, private monitoring. So P, you, you know, it means that the signal is perfectly correlated, so we only look at uh, a public signal. And then uh, focus on uh, PPE, okay? And then uh, we prove a Fox theorem in a sense that uh, once we assume pairwise identifiability with eta sac that I'm gonna define in the next slide, and uh, we define this eta as uh, eta captures an informativeness of signal in some sense. And we prove that when one minus delta divided by eta goes to zero, we have a Fox theorem. And this condition, one minus delta divided by eta goes to zero, it's somewhat similar to one minus delta times chi square divergence in our upper bound is going to zero uh, as well. So it means that when our upper bound becomes very, very loose because when one minus delta divided by chi squared goes to zero, then we also get the Fox theorem at the same time. So when upper, our upper bound is getting very loose, uh, we say that that makes sense because in that environment, we know that the Fox theorem holds. So that, that's how we sort of try to argue that the upper bound is reasonably tight. And um, so the pairwise identifiability with eta stack. Uh, this is a little bit uh, mouthful, but uh, let me try to explain it uh, for the next uh, two minutes or something. So P bar of A, what is this? This is a vector. Uh, which is a distribution of public signal Y given A. So this is a vector in a signal space. And we normalize it by taking a square root of the distribution. Y square root, only answer that I can give you is that uh, it's kind of like a convenient measure to derive a clean result. And what is P bar I of A? This is the distribution that you can generate by deviating to the action that is not equal to the action that you're supposed to take under A. So A is the equilibrium action. You deviate to AI prime. Then you change the distribution to P of Y given A prime I, and that's as follows the uh, uh, equilibrium action. And we normalize this by equilibrium distribution square root of P Y given A. And you can imagine that if you take a Euclidean norm between this and this, uh, we sort of get the uh, chi-square divergence if you do the algebra. So that's why this form is kind of convenient for us, okay? And monitoring satisfies pairwise identifiability with eta slack if the following three conditions are satisfied. Uh, the first one is uh, we focus on a signal that happens with uh, significantly positive probability no less than eta. Since we are looking at the public monitoring and we allow public analyzation device, so we can always combine two signals at the same time to generate a new signal to always satisfy this uh, requirement. And why we need this requirement? If the signal happens very, very small probability compared to a discount factor, then using such a signal to deter deviation is very difficult because if something happens very small compared to a discount factor, it essentially means that the people don't care about such a signal. So that's why we need this. And the last two are so-called pairwise fluent conditions. These are easy to uh, look at by just looking at the picture. So uh, the second uh, requirement is, if you look at the P bar of A, that is this distribution, and consider the convex scale of what player I can generate by deviation. So, you know, player I can 
deviates to AI ply generate this distribution, take a convex hull. And this is what player J can generate, take a convex hull. And take a convex hull of these two. Then these, the convex hull of these two is separated by this uh, point by some hyperplane whose distance between the equilibrium distribution and the, this uh, convex hull of these two deviation distribution is lower bounded by square root of eta. So this essentially says that, uh, you know, deviation can be detected with a sufficient procedure eta. And uh, since we are looking at the pairwise full run, we also need some, uh, something like this. So here's an equilibrium distribution. This is what player I can generate. This is what player J can generate. And we can show, uh, we, we need to put the hyperplane that put every player J's deviation on one side, every player I's deviation distribution on the other side, and the distance between this equilibrium point and uh, the deviation of player I uh, is bounded by square root of eta according to this hyperplane. What does this say is that uh, supposing that we want to monitor player I's deviation, okay? Then uh, we can sort of punish player I if signal very away from the equilibrium distribution happens according to this uh, normal vector of this hyperplane. That's a regular field of be mask in type kind of argument. Okay. And to keep efficiency, when we punish player I and the subtract condition pair from player I, we're going to give it to player J. Okay. And in that case, player I wants to avoid the deviation as much as possible to get closer to this point, right? Because that's, uh, that's the best way to avoid deviation. Player J actually gets a transfer from player I to player J if player I's deviation is detected. So player J wants to go getting closer and closer to this convex hell, right? Because that's when you get the transfer from player I. And the best way to get closer to this convex hull is since player J's convex hull is on the other side of the hyperplane, the best way is to get this point by taking like a action. So this sort of like gives us a pairwise full condition as in a regular film of living argument. So putting everything together, uh, uh, let F star be the set of payoffs that weekly predominates a payoff, which is a convex combination of a static Nash equilibrium. Uh, since we only look at the uh, detector B, uh, identifiability of the pure actions, so we are not looking at the mixed strategies. Uh, so we consider Nash select Fox theorem. So uh, fix F star then for any V in the interior of F star, there exists a sufficiently small constant row such that uh, if a uh, signal satisfies pairwise identifiability with eta slack, and the delta is sufficiently uh, large so that one minus delta divided by rho, uh, by the eta is sufficiently small, then V is a perfect uh, public uh, equilibrium. All right. And then, uh, since I'm almost out of time, uh, let me finish with uh, this thought. So individual identify P version of pairwise identifiability. So if we don't worry about pairwise identifiability, just try to detect the deviation of player I by creating a distance between the equilibrium distribution and deviation distribution by square root of eta. Doing the math, we can actually show that uh, this is equivalent to chi square divergence is no less than eta. So our uh, lower bound says that the one minus delta divided by chi squared is small, then we have a Fox theorem. So putting everything together, what we did is the following. So we have a negative result that the deviation gain, or like upper bound, deviation gain cannot exceed this much. And to get the detectability of deviation for the upper bound, we take the easiest uh, deviation to detect. Okay. And for the negative re uh, positive results, the Fox theorem case, if you look at the, this uh, eta is essentially is a chi square divergence, we can say when one minus uh, chi square divergence, so if this part, the chi square divergence divided by one minus delta is large, we have a Fox theorem. But for the positive result, of course, we cannot uh, just uh, detect the easiest one. 
we need to detect everything. So we look at the hardest deviation to detect where, you know, two different actions, but minimizes the chi scale distance. And also other players take some action that could be very bad for detector deviation, but nonetheless, this is the lowest uh, detectability of deviation. So this is the hardest case of detector deviation. And even if we use that, uh, chi squared is sufficiently large compared to one minus delta, we have a whole theorem. Uh, and we also need to add the pairwise identifiability for, for the positive case. So th this, is, uh, this is a summary. And then we apply our upper bound for large population games, frequent action limit, and the convergence rate of equilibrium pale set to the full theorem. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any questions? Uh, People feel free to unmute yourself and uh, ask questions. Okay, uh, I have a question then. <laughs> so you give uh, bounds to what we can achieve uh, with private monitoring, but mm -hmm. you use a a mediator on one result, yeah. and then public monitoring for another result, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So you never, uh, you only do bounds. So you don't really need to define uh, the equilibrium itself, sequential equilibrium. You know, you, you avoid this uh, mess. Oh, so for, for upper bound, our equilibrium concept is Nash equilibrium. So it's yeah. a loosest equilibrium concept. And for the uh, uh, lower band for, for the folk serum case, we look at the public monitoring and I look at the PPE. So yes, yes. we can sort of, yeah. So, so essentially uh, we can avoid those kind of complication coming from the equilibrium concept. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it makes it cleaner, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, like of course, like, you know, there are a whole bunch of other questions, right? Like, like, can we dispense with a mediator and get a tighter mm -hmm. upper bound? In that case, what kind of equilibrium concept we should use? Even with mediator, like what kind of equilibrium concept we should use? Yeah. How big of the difference we can make and all that stuff. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any any other questions of uh, people in the audience? Okay, well. Yeah, I, that... can, I can stick around if people want to ask questions after recording sure. with, with a small number of participants. Sure, sure. Then uh, if there are no further questions for now, then uh, we thank you again. And I stop the recording.